Timer's going, and we are live. Welcome to Diffused Congruence. This is episode 33 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my friend and co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Yeah, greetings, everyone. Uh, good to be here. Good to be back. It's We've had an we've had unexpected hiatus. Uh, we, we waited a little bit over a month since our last episode, um, but I almost felt like when, when our last episode dropped, we had that sort of initial period where uh, I think as far as we're concerned, Zeki, you know, the, that the, that episode just went, quote unquote, viral, as it were. And we had a really amazing response from the Dr. Omar podcast. And and that's more a testament to Dr. Omar than it is to us. Oh, I think. certainly. <laughs> certainly. But uh, it, it kind of it kind of works out that we did yes. wait a little because. <laughs> Uh, we have a guest joining us who is perfectly equipped to ha- help us uh, understand some of the the tides of history that are that are flowing around us. And uh, let me go ahead and not bury the lead. Our, our guest is Professor Muhammad Fadl, who is an associate professor at the Faculty of Law at University of Toronto, which he joined in January 2006. Professor Fadl wrote his PhD dissertation on legal process in medieval Islamic law while at the University of Chicago. He was admitted to the bar of New York in 2000 and also served as a law clerk. Professor Fadl has published numerous articles in Islamic legal history and Islam and liberalism. Professor Fadl, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. It's my honor. Well, we have a lot of current events that are that are swirling around us that very much call for somebody of your caliber to help us figure out, and, and we're very grateful to be able to have this opportunity. Well, I hope I can help out. I don't know if I can figure them out, but I've got, <laughs> might maybe have some interesting thoughts. Absolutely, absolutely, and and, and yeah, I, I think uh, like Zucky said, I mean, we're really totally uh, uh, honored to have you on the show, and, and really want to unpack some of this stuff. Um, you know, I was mentioning to you off air how uh, it, it is timely in, in not only to have someone of your caliber to sort of comment on what's going on around us, but also in the sense of uh, timely in our in the sense of our little podcast world here because. On the last show with Dr. Armour that I was re- re- the re- uh, referencing at the outset, um, he did mention your name uh, and, and the input that you provided on his book on Malik and the Medinan School. So, um, uh, uh, which it, it kind of sort of lends itself to one of the, I think, the pro- one, of, one of the both blessings and uh, one of the challenges we're going to have of having someone like yourself on the show is because I'm so tempted to just kind of get into a conversation about medieval Islamic law and, and you are more than a, uh, able to comment on that and, and sort of lead the discussion for the, for the duration of the podcast. But uh, like Zucky said, I think there's, there are some things that are happening um, more topically perhaps that we would love your input on. Um, so Dr. Fadl, um, you know, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, you know, I, I know where you are now teaching law um, and prior to that, you, were, you, you practiced as an attorney in New York City uh, for Sullivan and Cromwell, Cromwell uh, University of Virginia, under, uh, sorry, law school, University of Chicago, PhD. But uh, where does your story sort of begin, the origin story, as it were? <laughs> well, you know, I was born in Cairo, Egypt, and my family moved to the United States in 1970, although probably moving is, is putting way too much of a retrospective perspective on it. My father came to the United States on a fellowship, wow. um, University of Chicago, and had no intention of staying in the United States. As things happened, um, he and my mother decided to stay, and they ended up making their careers here. Um, and so um, I guess it was happy circumstance that we ended up staying in the United States. We lived in Chicago for five years, and then my parents moved to Augusta, Georgia, where they uh, – uh, they were each professors of medicine in the Medical College of Georgia. Um, they continue to live there to this day. Um, I grew up there, I guess, uh, you know, concluded elementary school, junior high, and high school, and then went to University of Virginia for college in the late 80s, and then University of Chicago for grad school, back to UVA for law school. And then I, um, you know, between clerking and private practice, worked as a lawyer for seven years or so, and then have been teaching law since 2006. 
in the meanwhile, um, you know, I spent a couple of years in Egypt studying Arabic, mm -hmm. um, got married. We now have four kids. Our oldest daughter should be graduating from university soon. So wow. time has flown rapidly. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, and just sort of hearing you talk about some of your, I mean, just some of your background, it's 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 remarkable. Just what you know, in terms of like the way our paths cross. Uh, you know, Dr. Omar, when he, we had him on on the last show, he kind of talks about growing up in Georgia as well. I mean, although his roots aren't from Georgia, he moves there at a young age. So I don't know if you, if, if you even know that he kind of grows no, up. I, because he, his, he told me he had some University of Georgia connection. I can't remember. He did. Well, his father, yeah, his father was professor of veterinary medicine there. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, he spent. He talks about kind of growing up, uh, you know, obviously during and 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 just his experiences, uh, you know, living in the South, as it were, at, at, you know, at, at, during that period of time in American history. Um, and uh, yeah, like yourself, sort of meanders through uh, the East Coast and then winds up at the University of Chicago as well. Um, and then I know that uh, you and some of our other guests, like Dr. Sherman Jackson and and others um, share a lot of, uh, of overlap as well. Yes, that's true. <laughs> I was, Professor Jackson was the head of uh, CASA. CASA, right. Summer Arabic, I um, mean, a year-long Arabic program at the University of Cairo. He was there in the 80s, and I was a student there. So I first met him when he was the director of CASA in 1988, mm -hmm. actually. Right, right. Yeah, fascinating. Um, so, uh, Zucky, yeah, yeah, you want to start things off in terms of uh, what we have on our mind to talk with uh, Professor Fuggle about? Well, I mean, I think I think just to start things off, let's let's dive into the deep end of the pool because uh, we are in the thick of an election season. So let's dive into the thick end of the pool, as it were. Uh, and there's a lot of thickness on display because Donald Trump just ran away with the South Carolina primary which uh, certainly says something, and uh, we're not quite sure what it says, but uh, it's an indicator of where the Republican electorate is at right now, and we see other indications of that by virtue of the fact that we're now one week after uh, Antonin Scalia passed away, which has now thrown the Supreme Court into uh, the future of the Supreme Court, I should say, into some kind of disarray. So a lot of really interesting constitutional and political issues that are that are sort of intertwining with each other. And I guess from from your perspective, I'd love to get your take on uh, what what the current uh, political temperature is, says about uh, uh, the the state of our our uh, electorate right now. Well, I mean, I would discuss Trump in connection also with Bernie Sanders if we want to talk about the state of the electorate. I think the <coughs> the relative strengths of both Trump and Sanders, despite there being uh, very radically different personalities, speaks volumes to the fact that substantial numbers uh, of the American electorate are alienated from mainstream politics. Hmm. And whenever that happens, that's the cause for concern. And I think it's a signal for mainstream politicians that there are important unanswered questions that need to be answered. Um, and it's the role of politicians to provide positive solutions to this kind of alienation. I think the risk that, that, that um, Trump poses is that he gives false answers to these problems, particularly in a form that's xenophobic and tends toward bigotry. In other words, he wants to blame others for some very serious structural problems inside the United States. Um, Bernie Sanders is certainly better in that regard. Um, he's certainly not a bigot. Uh, I think he has a much more optimistic view of the United States, a much more inclusive uh, uh, message for the United States. And as so as between Sanders and Trump, obviously there's no contest. Sanders is head and shoulders a superior candidate. At the same time, though, I think Sanders' message is also uh, can be attacked for a kind of um, reductionism and a certain kind of tendency to blame a certain group, namely bankers. I know everybody likes to blame, to blame bankers <laughs> for all the problems in the economy um, and also things like free trade. Uh, I think those kinds of issues on the left, um, although not nearly as repulsive as immigrant baiting and nativism, as you see on the right, are also misleading. 
because they offer uh, two easy solutions to very, very complicated problems. And so when you see this kind of um, uh, reaction to otherwise, um, I guess, marginal candidates, you know, politicians that are more established, that are more in the center, that's a signal to them that they really need to be adopting um, bold policies that will address the real problems of society. Because if they don't, then they leave the room open for what otherwise are what you would call extremist positions. And that's dangerous in any society, including the United States. Yeah. Well, and and I mean, I think it it's you know the the tendency is to sort of look at the rise the rise of uh, Trump and I suppose Sanders too if we're having that broader conversation as this phenomenon. But I mean, p- political movements tend to be much tend to have a much l- longer tail. So I mean, the the rise of um, this this desire for somebody who's who's so far outside the box, the traditional box. I mean, what what can we trace it to? I mean, how far back would you look at the roots of this phenomenon as? Well, I think you could go back for the last quarter century, mm-hmm. maybe a little more, and you can find um, income stagnation among the broad middle class in the United States. Not just income stagnation, um, income decline in many cases, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, that has a lot to do, frankly, with globalization, right? I mean, simple, simple economics teaches you, you know, when you have more of a supply of something um, and the demand for that supply does not increase as rapidly as the supply does, then you are going to have a decrease in the price. That's just simple, you know, microeconomics 101 law supply and demand. And as uh, one result of globalization, one immediate result of globalization has been the entry of millions and millions and millions of people into the global workforce, hmm. particularly at the lower to mid, uh, mid-range skills end, right? right. And so that means suddenly, you know, if you're a manufacturer in Detroit, uh, it's just as easy for you to make cars in, um, in, in Mexico, in China, in you know, uh, maybe not so much in India, but one day India, um, and then ship them here, right, as it is to make them in Detroit. And, you know, in connection with, you know, globalization and the increased practical access to labor, you also had many fold revolutions in transportation. And so right. now, you know, intramodal transportation it sounds very boring and wonkish, right? <laughs> but the cost of transporting goods has decreased exponentially. Right, because of innovations like the the uh, the uh, um, you know the new mode of in- intermodal shipping, where you just have um, I can't remember why I don't know why I can't remember the term now, but the uh, the uh, uh, the kind of thing they put on ships now I can't remember what they're called. Sorry. Sure. Um, uh, so it used to be quite expensive, you know, uh, transporting goods by sea, but it's much, it's become greatly standardized. It's been linked with railroads and, you know, the whole thing has become much, much, much more cheaper, much cheaper and much more efficient than it was even 50 years ago. Right. And there are winners and losers in this. New York used to be a great port. Now it's not Mm -hmm. right. Because, uh, you know, uh, technological improvement in logistics has made New York irrelevant. Now you want big, giant, deep sea ports like you have, like say in Long in uh, Long Beach, California, or Savannah, Georgia, right? Um, and so all these things, this creation of an international marketplace, uh, has really hurt the lower to middle skill sector of the uh, of the workforce because they're now competing not just against people in a local market but worldwide. So that's depressed wages. That's you know that's basically I think the bottom line is that. There have been winners and losers. The winners are the highly educated uh, people who have capital, who've been able to invest it and earn profits from globalization. The losers have been uh, the low skilled people, right? And that's why you see many of the base, uh, you know, the, the core support of both Trump and Sanders coming from the same economic groups, more or less. They have different answers, but from a Um, class perspective, they share many things in common. And so we need to think of some new policies that 
alleviate this problem of income stagnation. I think that's the biggest challenge facing the United States. Well, and and this is fascinating to me because because so you're you're talking about the same group of of voters that have found, you know, an avatar in these two candidates who could not be more different. That's right. But they're both complaining about loss of income. Right? Huh. Sure. You know, uh, Trump is constantly complaining about how I just heard him on the radio last night, how China has pulled off the biggest theft in the history of the world. That's how he describes it. Mm-hmm. Right? And so he pins it all on, on, on foreigners. But Sanders, you know, he has a different set of villains, but it's the same set of the same idea, basically, that you that, you know, the average American is being screwed because of what well, he calls it a rigged economic system in favor of the elite. Right. right. Sure. And so it, it's a it's a di- it's a bl- both play a blame game. It's a different kind of blame game. And as I said, if I had to choose between the two, I choose Sanders. But I think both of them offer completely unrealistic and, and, and in some respects, quite dangerous solutions. But, you know, I think what's what's interesting here is that when, when we talk about uh, Trump and Sanders, it's worth pointing out that even now, despite how much, uh, you know, the grassroots support uh, Bernie Sanders is ostensibly generating, he's still, even at this stage, a long shot. The conventional wisdom is that most probably Hillary Clinton will be the nominee. Whereas when you look at Donald Trump, it's it seems like the odds are, are higher that he will get the nomination than not. I don't know if I agree with that. Hmm. Um, I mean, I think if you read somebody like uh, Nate Silver on 538.com, yeah. I think it's pretty clear that we're looking at maximum Trump. Hmm. It's very hard for, for Trump to exceed the 32 33% threshold. Now, the only way that he could win, as far as I can tell, I'm not an expert on these things at all, is if there are some... You, know, you have to look at the rules for delegate allocation in each different Republican state. Many right. Republican states have winner-take-all primaries. So, you know, for example, I don't know what the rules are in South Carolina. If it's a winner-take-all state, even though he only got 33%, he gets 100% of the delegates, right? Right. So um, I recently read something that talked about Cruz. one of Cruz's big problems is that Cruz has a lot – his core voice of support is the evangelicals. Mm-hmm. It turns out that most of the states that have large percentages of evangelicals, evangelical voters, are propor- allocate delegates proportionally, right. like Texas, his home state. So he could win Texas, but he's not going to win at 80 to 20, for example. So he, end up, might, he, end, he'll, he will end up sharing a lot of those delegates with Trump and Rubio. But, but um, Trump seems to have an advantage in the states – that are um, winner take all uh, have winner take all rules, right? Mm-hmm. And so one could conceive of the possibility that if it stays a three way race through the end of March, Trump could win enough races because the majority of the Republican voters are split between uh, Rubio and Cruz, so that Trump amasses a huge number of delegates, right? But for that to happen, it has to stay a three way race effectively for you know, at least another six weeks or so. And even then, it's still hard to imagine that he would actually get enough delegates to win. You could see a very exciting um, Republican convention. You could see a broker convention. You could see a third-party challenge, right? Right. Um, but I, I just don't see Trump as ever exceeding more than 33%. Well, and I think that also maybe speaks to why Trump – even as recent as I think yesterday or something, made a statement about how he would still consider running as an independent, right? Yeah. There's always that sort of specter of, of, of if he doesn't get the nomination of, 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 of you know, of, of the Republican ticket, that he will, he, you know, he could conceivably run again, self-financed, um, you know, as an independent. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I like people. People should be uh, have a little more. Um... I guess circum- circumspection when they analyze results of early primaries mm. uh, and then try to project forward the nomination, much less the general election. Remember, there are only only 30 percent of the electorate is registered as Republican, right? Mm-hmm. So if a third of, re- of Republicans are voting for Trump, that amounts to 10 percent of the, of the electorate. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's a far cry from electoral majority or a juggernaut. I mean, he's very good 
at talking a good game and publicizing himself, right? right? But you know, step back and think a little more analytically, and I think you you have to come to the conclusion that his chances are still very small. Right. Well, right. and and I think I mean, what what's worth pointing out here is that regardless of whether he gets the nomination or not, if if we're down to a three-way race between Trump. Uh, Cruz and Rubio, we've still seen the the what 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 constitutes sort of Republican orthodoxy move very sharply to the right. In that, all three of these candidates have espoused uh, positions that even a couple of years ago would have been viewed as sort of fringe fringe actors. Well, yes and no, right? I mean, I think, for example, if we're talking to the right with respect to you know. Muslim positions, their positions on Muslims. Um, I think they're vocalizing things that have been, you know, a, a pretty dominant undercurrent among the Republican grassroots for quite a long time mm -hmm. during the Bush administration. If you paid careful attention to what the Republican grassroots were saying during um, W's time, they were often quite angry at him for what they thought was pro pro Muslim rhetoric. In fact, what's, what's sort of ironic is they're, you know, they're, 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 they're uh, skewering Obama for his refusal to use the term radical Islam, right? But Obama hasn't, hasn't said half the good things about Islam that George W. Bush did. That's right. right. Um, and so certainly in that respect, there's been a lot more explicit anti-Muslim uh, rhetoric from the Republican uh, politicians. But in that respect, I think they're just mirroring uh, the views of, you know, the, 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 the Republican activists. Now, I, I do believe that Rubio came out yesterday and took Trump to task for some of, his more, some of his more extreme statements. But again, compared to George W. Bush, they're all way to the right of Bush when it comes to anti-Muslim rhetoric. But it's, this is an important point about Trump. If you start looking at Trump's economic policies, that's right, right. he is very, very unorthodox. He's he against free trade, right? He's, um, I mean, he's presumably, he said statements suggesting he's in favor of universal health care, right? He wants to um, improve the, the uh, incomes for working people. You know, th that's what makes Trump's, Trump an interesting candidate in many ways. And, he, and, and even on the on the sort of social issues, right? He's not he's not a hard ideologue like Ted Cruz, for example. When oh, it comes certainly to not. Social issues. Yeah. yeah I, I jokingly say that among the Republican candidates, Trump is the most reasonable. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, I, absolutely. And and you know, I, I was uh, listening to uh, I think it was Robert Wright, and he was talking about how sort of the you know Cruz scares him far more than than than, than Trump. I agree. Yeah, and, and to me, it's it's, I mean. In spite of the the very dangerous and volatile sort of rhetoric, um, com, you know that 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 Trump says, uh, or coming out from Trump, um, I think it's 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 really it's almost easy to dismiss him as sort of like playing that reality show again, right? He's just playing an act. I mean, he's just playing a role. It's it's really the more um, stringent ideologue, like say a Cruz, that is far more uh, far more dangerous when it comes to policy. Well, I agree with that, but I also think that Cruz has even less of a chance of being elected president than does Trump. Wow. So who? So so then, in your mind, who who do you see um, it, it coming down to? I really do. I really don't know. I don't know how the Republicans are going to solve this mess they've gotten themselves in. But I think wow. it's you know, in some ways, it's 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 comeuppance for the fact that they've tolerated so yeah. much bigotry and irrationality. For the last eight years, I mean, they've right. instead of trying to work as a constructive opposition to Obama, they've um, they've thrown gasoline on the fire. They've fed the the, the flames of bigotry to mobilize their own uh, masses, mm -hmm. their, their base, and now they're suddenly shocked. The leadership is suddenly shocked that they're having loonies winning elections, oh. right? Wow. And so you know, um, once you let the loonies out of the bag, it's hard to get them back in. Right. 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 So I don't no, feel absolutely. that much sympathy for the Republicans, frankly. Yeah. They've gotten right. themselves into this situation. Although, I, I mean, I think it's bad for the United States to have a dysfunctional Republican Party. Right. Especially in a two parties. Yeah. When you essentially have two part, two viable parties anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And, 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 and so do you, do you think that 
And, and I agree with you. This is sort of eight years in the making in terms of tolerating the rise of the, of the Tea Party and 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 just the, 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 the just the way the base has gone further and further to the right. Um, and 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 where once were fringe movements or fringe attitudes have now become mainstream within the party. Do you feel like this election then, or or what what may happen at the at the convention or with the with the with the primary? Sort of be a wake-up call to the to, to the actual establishment, as it were, um, that couldn't get a Bush, uh, you know, a, a, as as the nominee. I hope so, and I mm-hmm. think you know this might be a good time to segue to Scalia, because I think the best thing that would happen to the Republican Party is if a liberal was appointed as the fifth justice of the Supreme Court, and that and then turned allow the Supreme Court to undo much of the reactionary jurisprudence over the last 40 years, that would put an end effectively to the culture wars. Um, And that would allow the Republican Party to, you know, cut the umbilical cord with the right-wing lunatics, right? Hmm. so then would you I, – I, I'm, I'm sort of reading between the lines, but then are, are, are you – and I, I would love to segue into the conversation about Scalia. So then are you saying that, that much of what we see with, with regards to the culture wars um, is there, as a result of this 5-4 uh, divide that we see on, this, on, the, on the bench? Yeah, because I think um, the Supreme Court, mm-hmm. starting in the 70s, led a reactionary campaign against the attempt to make the United States a more egalitarian – more inclusive country. And it basically created um, different opportunities for local majorities, oftentimes bigoted and racist majorities, to entrench themselves against national majorities, right? Um, In the name of things like states' rights, in the names of uh, colorblindness, in the name of you know, uh, property rights in the case of uh, uh, restricting unionization on a whole host of issues. The Supreme Court, not just Supreme Court, but conservative justices that uh, Reagan and Bush, uh, Bush one and Bush two were able to appoint. They've been fighting this rear guard action against progressive policies in the United States. Um, And one of the one of the indirect effects of that, as I said, was uh, empowering these local local majorities that in many cases are outright bigoted, right? Wow. And so once you have a liberal majority in the Supreme Court that can go back and revisit many of these really, you know, very, very important cases mm-hmm. uh, uh, that were decided by the Rehnquist Court um, and now the uh, the current court, um, that could really, really change, I think, the political dynamics of the United the States. The Roberts Court. And it could also, I think, improve the dynamics of the Republican Party because they wouldn't be so beholden anymore to to Southern voters. Hmm. So what one was I mean, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm a bad student of the law here or, or, or showing that. But uh, when was the last time we did have a liberal court? I mean, are, are we talking? We're, we're, I, I know, like, generally we're talking about the 1960s, but is that the Warren Court? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thought well, basically so. okay. from the time that, that Justice Rehnquist became the chief under Nixon. Under Nixon, that's right. For some reason, I thought Rehnquist was appointed by Reagan. Okay, right, absolutely. So it was, yeah, Nixon prior to that. Um, and so, yeah, well, that's, that's he wasn't fascinating. Chief justice. He wasn't chief justice under Nixon. He was appointed to the bench to the Supreme right. Court under Nixon. Berger was uh, the chief justice under Nixon. And then he eventually became, I think Reagan was what made him chief justice. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Berger mm-hmm. courts and the Rehnquist courts really, and then... Um, the current court, again, they've been fighting these rear guard actions against anything that would make more or less the United States a more egalitarian country. Hmm. And so, uh, I mean, I, I'd love to just get your thoughts in general about Scalia as a jurist. I mean, you know, not to speak ill of the dead, as it were, but I mean, just just for, as, 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 as a professor of law and as a, as a legal expert, you know, what do you think this sort of is the everlasting impact of of, of, of Scalia as a jurist? I think one of the main things that he did was really solidify the polarization that we see on the court, right? Hmm. And his stridency, his, um, one might say, his fanaticism and his views about uh, originalism and, and also the very strategic ways that he, he deployed it, right, uh, in the service 
of what you know what seems to me clearly a political agenda he was against right he was against affirmative action now i don't know why he was against affirmative action i have no reason to think that he was personally racist or anything mm -hmm. but he was simply against affirmative action and uh, even as an originalist or particularly if one were originalist one should be able to um, reconcile affirmative action with um, remedial race-based categories since it was used at the time of the 14th Amendment, but nevertheless, he, uh, he rejected it completely and demanded a race-blind so-called interpretation of the 14th Amendment, which in effect undermines the ability of it to be used as a remedy, as a remedial tool for past discrimination. Um, mm. So it's, uh, you know, he, he, he claimed to be this originalist, but it seemed to be an originalism that was only in the service of certain conservative ideals, right? Mm. Um, the and other thing and you that, see that less. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that those are sort of like in the 14th Amendment um, and personal freedom cases. I think you um, also uh, see the mark that he made. And I mean, these are sort of technical legal issues, but his commitment to what constitutional lawyers call the, the structural constitution, like this, yeah. you know, this sort of fanatic belief in the separation of powers that the form of government is really, really important, sometimes more than the substance. And, and so he was a strong supporter of the administrative state and the powers of the executive, extremely deferential to executive power. And this came out in his decisions governing um, not only administrative law, but also in federal state relations. Right. Um, one way of looking at uh, Gore v. Bush, if you, I don't know how old you are, yeah. but, um, you know, one way of understanding that case was that inside the state of Florida, there was a battle going on between the Ju Florida judiciary, which That's wanted right. the recount to continue, and the Florida executive branch, which wanted to put an end to it. Right. Right. And the Supreme Court, by ruling in favor of putting an end in Catherine Harris, I think, or Kathleen Harris, I think was her name. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Catherine. They, effect they effectively Catherine. sided. They sided with the executive branch. Right. They did against the against the state. Against the state Supreme Court. <laughs> right. This, this was consistent. You know, a lot right. of people said, "Well, this is inconsistent with his federalism jurisprudence, in which the federal government shouldn't interfere with uh, state state law." Right. But it's consistent with his view of how courts should have a very, very limited role in government. Right. Right. Um, another example, again, during the Rehnquist Court and, and Scalia was very, on, very much on board on this. If you look at Fourth Amendment cases, search and seizure cases, the way they often came up to the United States Supreme Court is through state Supreme Courts, because most arrests in the United States are done by state police, not the FBI. Right. So most case law governing the Fourth Amendment originate in state courts. Right. So oftentimes, a state Supreme Court would exclude evidence on the grounds that it violated the Fourth Amendment. And then what would happen is that the, the, the state prosecutor would appeal to the United States Supreme Court. Now, this is an odd situation insofar as you have a state Supreme Court allegedly sort of giving effect to the federal right, to exclude, um, namely that's set out in the Fourth Amendment, um, and saying that the state violated a federal right, but then having the state appeal it to the United States Supreme Court saying, no, we didn't um, violate a federal right. Now, again, here you have a battle, a conflict inside a state concerning the interpretation of the Fourth Amendment between the executive branch and the judicial branch. And in almost, in, in almost all Fourth Amendment cases, the Supreme Court ends up siding with the state executive branch and overturning the state judiciary, right? Um, and so I think that is also another one of the important legacies of Scalia, great deference to the state executive. Um, and with, you know, everybody is very interested now in the Black Lives Matter movement. You can see Scalia's hand in that too, because mm. um, people are often mystified. How is it the police can shoot 50 bullets into somebody yeah. and then um, not be found guilty of anything? Well, the reason is there's a doctrine called qualified immunity, right? Which, um, you know, it's not Scalia didn't make it up. Make make it up. It's a it's a long doctrine in common law. But Scalia made it a lot more protective of police and executive officials in general than it had been in the common law, because he argued that it would be impossible 
for executive officials to do their jobs efficiently if they were constantly worried about being sued and being asked questions about why they did things. Mm, right? That's right. Um, so, yes, Scalia's done a lot. I'm not necessarily um, all that great. I mean, <laughs> to, 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 in his defense, I mean, there were some things he was very good on. He was very good on free speech. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe too much so when you look at free speech of corporations and corporate spending. Um, right. But he did have a very robust, robust view of free speech. Um, also, in some search and seizure cases, he did come out uh, with a sort of robust sense of privacy, at least for the home. Um, right. sure. you know, and, and he was, I think, he also had a lot of influence on the way we read statutes. But again, this goes back to his limited, his theory of limited role of judges. So he was against judges using extrinsic evidence to interpret a statute, meaning, you know, yeah. we have a statute that applies to a case. We're just supposed to read the statute. We're not supposed to read the legislative debates. That's right. We're not supposed to look at the purposes of the statute. We're just supposed to apply the language of it as it is, very textualist. Mm -hmm. um, and his, his theory behind that was political, saying that's the job of Congress and the president to make laws, not for the courts. And so if the law you know, has a gap in it, um, that means that they couldn't have agreed to it. Um, we can't we can't supplement the law through our own will, right? We can't make up a law that doesn't exist, right? So again, mm -hmm. it's part of a political theory in which he believed judges should never be making law, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, it's not. One could say that that's not really part of the common law heritage which the United States sort of inherited from England, but he really pushed it and it had a lot of influence, right? That's right. That's right. Um, and, and, and you don't feel that the remaining uh, remaining uh, conservatives on the bench, namely, say, even a, Tho a, a, a Thomas sort of has the like, you know, you know, like what, what Scalia brought to the brand, to, to, to the bench. Well, Scalia was a law professor before he was a judge. So he, mm -hmm. he also wrote a lot. Mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, that I think gave him a little more heft. In terms of his influence, right? that's right, and you can even hear it in the legal in the in the legal arguments that are made before the bench, um, you know, b before the court. He's far more engaging than, well, certainly than Thomas, but uh, e even I think some of the more recent uh, uh, conservative judges that came, Alito, oh, Alito, and, and even Tom, and even Roberts, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that doesn't mean there aren't other conservative judges who are important. There are plenty, but oh, he was—he no. he, was—he was very influential. There's just no, there's no way to get around that. Right, right. Um, and so now, and and so here we are um, in in terms of uh, like what the discussion is or the conversation is today, which is um, about Obama nominating the replacement, obviously, and of course the right uh, almost predictably and the Republicans are saying that there should be almost sort of this moratorium and we wait until a new, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we wait until the election year is over. Um, that would be contrary to sort of historical precedent. Am I, am I right? I mean, we've had, yeah, well, it's, I think, it's, I think it's, it's 24 absurd. times, 24 times that we've had uh, this type of a, this type of, a, of an instance occur. And out of those 24 times, 21 times the sitting president has, you know, made the nomination. It's, the claim is absurd on its face. First of all, <laughs> there's nothing in the Constitution that says right. the president loses his ability to nominate a Supreme Court justice because he's in the last year of his term. I mean, the idea the idea yeah. itself is crazy because according, the Constitution assumes that Supreme Court justices are not political, right? That That's right. The idea is that the president is supposed to be nominating a qualified justice and the Senate is supposed to consider him on his or her merits as a judge, nothing else. But for the last 35 years, as we all know, all right. the appointment process has become incredibly politicized. And so the Republicans, because they know so much of their power hangs on the identity of the federal judiciary, right? Fight I'm sorry, real quick. for every judge. You said 35 years. I mean, did you kind of trace it back to the sort of Bork nomination during the Reagan? Yeah, but President Reagan appointed ideologues to the bench. Mm -hmm. right? He used his power of judicial appointment to appoint conservative ideologues to the court with the express goal of overturning 
the legacy of the Warren Court. Right. Mm -hmm. So wow. Reagan consciously ideolo ideologized, if that's a word, uh, the federal judiciary. Right. He he wanted to populate the federal bench with conservative ideologues so that they could leave an imprint on the law, the law for a generation. And he succeeded. Right. Obama, on the other hand, has generally been, you know, he from the beginning, he's tried to be a conciliator, try to be moderate, try to bring, uh, you know, in his in his in his in his in his bills and in his judicial appointments, trying to appoint people that are middle of the road, relatively speaking, but that doesn't appease the Republicans. I mean, something like I don't know how many. There are a huge number of judicial seats that are vacant in the federal circuit courts, and the, the Republicans refuse to move on Obama's nominees. It's it's really quite ridiculous. Um. And, and there's a reason for that is because they need to have certain kinds of interpretations of federal statutory law and constitutional law to maintain their power. It's a really a life or death kind of situation for them. You know, if you have a, if you have a majority of five liberal justices, it could potentially undo much of the conservative case law that has been done in the last 30 years that is so crucial to Republican power at the federal level. Right. So, so, so I mean, uh, why, why is, I mean, I guess, I guess my question is, why is that? Why is it that so much of, of the Republican hold on power resides in sympathetic courts? And why is it, why is it that the opposite is not true? Um, Insofar as you know, the the liberals relying so heavily on the court, it 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 seems it seems like you see that much more with with conserv conservatives and the court than with liberals in the court. Well, okay. Part of the the, the debate here has been, I mean, among Scalia and and let's say the liberals, is the role of the judiciary in supervising. Um, politics in the United States, right? So in the United States Constitution, lots of things are delegated to the political process. For example, uh, people will be sort of shocked to hear this, but there's no constitutional right to universal suffrage in the United States. Hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the the right to vote is is delegated to the states to decision to 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 decide. Now, because of the Fourteenth Amendment, they can't do so on discriminatory terms. Right. But they have the right to, for example, disenfranchise felons, which many states, particularly in the South, do. Right. Now, if you look at the way these laws are applied, combined with discriminatory police enforcement, it, 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 it results in a massive disenfranchisement of blacks. OK, yeah. now, mm -hmm. liberal justices would take this to be quite suspicious behavior and would be much more willing to intervene in policing such laws than Republicans, or at least Scalia kinds of Republicans, who say this is a matter of, po of politics. It's been delegated to the states, and in the absence of express evidence of racism, there's nothing wrong with it. Right, right. right? Okay. Um, another example is, is districting. As you, as I'm sure you're aware, one of the ironies of U.S. elections is that the is that the Republicans have been able to dominate the House of Representatives, even in situations when they get less than a majority of the popular vote on a national basis. Right. So you have a, so the House of Representatives is supposed to represent supposed to be the popular branch of government, right? Hmm. Um, yet when you aggregate all the votes cast in these elections in, in elections for for members of the House of Representatives. Republicans will get a minority of the votes cast, yet a majority, and not by one or two, but like 20 or 30 seats in the House. Well, why is that? Because they use their power to, to um, create, to drop congressional districts um, in state, at state level governments to right. gerrymander districts in such a way mm -hmm. as to reduce the voting power of Democratic voters. Right? That's right. I mean, being from Texas, uh, you know, Tom DeLay, that was his legacy. And, and, and so Supreme, the Supreme Court allows that, but by the barest of margins. Again, if you have a, if you have a majority of li liberal justices, you might have a much more reasonable standard 
of how redistricting could take place, right? Wow. Um, and so, uh, you know, and you can go on and on. Again, the Supreme right. Court under Rehnquist and then under uh, uh, Roberts has basically made affirmative action forbidden. Right? So it becomes very hard to use the powers of the federal government or the powers of state government to ameliorate inequality because you can't say that we want to pass a law to help minorities. Right? So, I mean, if, if you're a member... By, by the way, and that, that reduces a lot of the incentive for minorities to participate in politics. That, that because, was my question. <laughs> because, look, you know, minorities rightly say, why should I vote? Democrats don't produce policies that are substantially different than Republicans. Well, one reason is, is because the Supreme Court has prevented them <laughs> from making po adopting policies that are racially ameliorative. Well, okay, so so you, you just answered the question I was going to ask, but but related to what we were talking about as far as gerrymandering and and sort of the what feels very much like the rigging of the game. I mean, how do you how do you unfry that egg? Because what we've essentially got is a House of Representatives that has engineered a way of always preserving the, the current balance of power. Well, you know, we have had very volatile swings in the, in the um, mix of uh, parties in, the, in Congress in the last few years. I mean, when I was growing up, the House, the, the Congress was, had been in Congression in Democrats' hands for like something like, I don't know, a huge number of years consecutively without any sort of change. Yeah. And then when it happened, it was like a huge deal. Right? In, when, in, when, in, when Newt Gingrich got a majority yeah, of Republicans in the House and the Congress. I remember what a big deal that was. Oh, yeah. Um, right. Now it, it, it flips back and forth like every other presidential election. Right. Mm -hmm. right? And so I think if we're really interested in promoting progressive change, what we have to do is get progressives elected not just to the presidency, but to, um, the, con to, the, to the Senate and the House of Representatives. We have to have a complete idea of the kind of structural reforms that we, are that we need to get done so that um, government is much more representative than it is, right? right. Um, and sort of, you know, I mean, people hate the word contract for America, but what was brilliant about that was that Gingrich was able to distill what he thought the 10 most important priorities of the Republicans were into a list and get candidates to sign on. I think the Democrats should do the same thing. What are the 10 most important legislative priorities for the Democratic Party and also reforms that are necessary to allow the government to function much more effectively? But, but a lot of this hinges on the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court has struck down the possibility or made struck down progressive legislation in the past and has made it impossible to adopt progressive legislation, right? Or made it very difficult to. Right, right. So, I mean, I did, just to kind of maybe wrap up the, the, the conversation we've been having about the court, I mean, because I think we can go on talking about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, but, but, but uh, what do you see sort of like, I mean, so obviously you, you predict that Obama is able to at least put forth the nominee um, to the bench. Um, do you maybe have... If not names of, of, of uh, you know of, of a certain of certain people that he may push forward, or at least maybe a sort of an archetype of, of what what he may be looking for. Well, you know, I've, I've read different pieces talking about um, the various candidates he has. I have no doubt that whoever yeah. Obama nominates will be an excellent jurist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, very competent. Um, you know, an excellent uh, scholar of the law, an excellent advocate. Um, I have absolutely no doubt about that. I also have no doubt that he will not nominate a liberal icon. Hmm. I mean, uh, for good or for ill, that's just not how Obama proceeds. Sure. Um, you know, he's not going to nominate somebody, a, a liberal superstar. He's not going to nominate somebody who would be the liberal equivalent of a Scalia. Right? Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, but, you know, the, I think that the, the good news is it's, it's probably not even re required to have a liberal ideologue to sort of begin to allow the Supreme Court to function in a way that would be consistent with um, having a much more progressive and inclusive politics. But, you know, I, I have no doubt also that Obama will nominate somebody, and I also have no doubt that the Republicans will do nothing. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, wow. The only way they will do something is if Republican senators 
who are up for re-election think that they will be punished at the polls if they don't move on the nomination. Uh, right, good, yeah, yeah. Well, these, are, these are very sort of subtle points. I think that's very hard to get the average uh, voter to understand. That's right. Voters are going to mo- mobilize around you know, having a hearing for uh, uh, Obama Supreme Court nominee. Right. Well, and and you know, my, my question in regards to this, and obviously this is coming from somebody who's on the outside looking in. I mean, it feels like, you know, in a lot of ways, the the founding fathers could not have anticipated the level of just abject, you know, uh, vitriol. Yeah, vitriol plus dysfunction that we have. And I I wanted to ask about this because, you know, the the Constitution to me feels like it was it was drafted. Un, with the with the assumption that people will work towards the common good, where people will be like, well, half a loaf is better than no loaf, and so a situation like this, which is you know sort of without precedent, where Scalia has been you know the the his death announcement is not even an hour old, and the leader of the Senate says, we're don't even bother, we're not going to vote on whoever you nominate. I mean, is there a constitutional remedy for this? Well, I mean, I, you know, you could easily imagine this becoming a constitutional crisis. Hmm. If suppose a Democrat wins, let's suppose that the Republicans, you know, do what they are good at their good for their word, and they refuse to act on Obama's nominee. Uh, there's election. Let's suppose a Democrat wins, right? Yeah. What makes you think they'll move on a nominee of Sanders or or Clinton, right? Sure. Um, no evidence that they would do that. And there's nothing in the Constitution that would provide a mechanism to force them to or give the president a way to circumvent that, right? So they have a sort of an effective veto by simply inaction, right? Hmm. Um, uh, Consider the reverse scenario. Suppose uh, a Republican wins, right? What incentive, why would any Democratic senators cooperate with them in appointing a new uh, Supreme Court justice, right. right? Maybe you know, turnabout is fair play. Right? Well, and they'll feel like you guys stole what should have been our opportunity to nominate a judge based on yeah. the rules of the game. Yes, exactly. So you could imme- uh, easily imagine this escalating into a constitutional crisis that could last for for mo- much more than one year. Wow. And uh, you know, I was sort of half joking. This, this reminds me, the, the closest thing this reminds me of is the crisis in the, you know, the antebellum era. Every time a new state wanted to be admitted to the Union, there was almost a cause of civil war because the South was afraid if it were a free state, then the North would have enough power to amend the Constitution, get rid of slavery. And, right. the, South, and the North was afraid that if it were a slave state, then it would allow for slavery to spread in the territories and eventually the South would dominate the North, right? So every time a new state came into the Union, it became an existential issue. So you get this feeling that the Supreme Court battles over nominations are becoming existential uh, for the Republicans. And uh, that's not a good thing, obviously. No. Right, right. And, And I mean, and I think it also is worth noting that I mean, obviously no one has a crystal ball, but if we look at even just the ages of some of the justices that are on the bench, like Ginsburg, as well as Kennedy, uh, in all likelihood, the next president could be nominating their replacements, whether they retire or what have you. Yeah. Um, you, may, you can sort of end up seeing some sort of compromise where, you know, they, they split the they split the justices, right? And then, and then you have an odd justice determined by coin flip or something. I mean, you know, I don't know. It's sort of crazy. Yeah, um, right. But, right. you know, one of the things about the original design of the Constitution, this is what, why originalism is so silly, right, is that you know, the, the founding fathers loathed political parties, and they assumed that there would be no political parties, right? Mm. And, 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 you know, this Republican fetishism with the structural constitution is so absurd, given the fact that, you know, one of the fundamental premises of the structural constitution is that we would have really high-minded citizens. And remember, That's at that right. time— We would have a warmed electorate, yeah. At that time, there was not universal suffrage. That's right. It was limited to a relatively elite body of the population. Exactly. They would not be divided into partisan factions, mm-hmm. right? They would not be, um, you know, pursuing self-interest, but they would kind of be these 
um, truly deliberative bodies. And they designed the Senate in such a way, you know, as they describe it in the Federalist Papers, as kind of a saucer in which the um, the, the 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 hot the hot tea of the masses in the House of Representatives could fall and sort of calm down, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you had this idea that the that the mixed government uh, and the and, and the and the and the and the um, division of of power, separation of powers, would have a way of allowing democratic participation while preserving enough independence for meaningful deliberation about the public good. That's right. right. But all those assumptions that they had about how these institutions work were clearly contingent and time bound to a kind of society that doesn't exist today, where you have massive, you know, big data, you know everything about every voter, you know everything about the, you know, what every person consumes on every street, and you can like um, tailor make your advertising campaign based on the fast food that this person buys, right? I don't know if you saw this thing that. Uh, Sanders supporters like Chipotle. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, tr Trump supporters prefer. Sonic. So, was it Sonic? Sonic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, right. So that is not the kind of world. That's yeah. not the kind of political world that the founders could have ever imagined. So why would we give so much weight to the political structure that they designed? It's, it's just totally silly. Mm. <laughs> Jeez. On that scary note, um, <laughs> and now the government, now this very government that we've been speaking of, um, wants Apple to uh, basically hack into our phones. Um, so to sort of pivot into this conversation, um, Professor Fadl, about obviously what's been brewing with Tim Cook's recent statement. I think prior to Tim, Tim Cook's statement, at least for those who aren't in the know, probably didn't even know that this was being, um, that this was sort of happening in the backdrop uh, with the court order. Could you talk maybe a little bit about not only the background of the specifics of this case, but uh, obviously its implications? Well, first of all, I think Tim Cook should be, should be applauded. Yeah. Right? He's taking a really courageous stand and something that's for the benefit of all, not just Apple consumers, but all, um, anybody who has any, who uses, uh, devices on the web today, right? Um, and I wish more companies would stand up to the United States when it, when it does these things. Now, what's a bit complicated about this case is that this isn't a case of where um, Apple has something in its possession and the United States needs that thing, whether it's an object or piece of information, in order to pursue an investigation, right? So this is not a search and seizure case. The United States has the phone. It has what it, it has what it wants, right? It just can't use it because Apple has this protocol in its phones, uh, which provides that if anybody, if you fail in entering your passcode ten consecutive times, it sort of does a self-destruct routine. <laughs> right. Basically, it, it, it initiates an automatic wipe. So everything is gone because it assumes it is now in the hands of someone who shouldn't have it, right? Now, I actually don't have an Apple. I'm one of the few people who still uses BlackBerry. But when I heard about this, I was like, that's really a good reason to have an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because you, know, you lose your you, – people lose their phones. Phones are stolen, et cetera. There's a lot of information on it. And as we're connected across devices – um, the fact that somebody could get your phone could suddenly give them access to all sorts of things. So it's a really great feature that there's this sort of self-destruct mechanism in it. Okay, so this isn't a case where Apple has some data on Sayed Farouk in its server that all it has to do is just find it and give it to the government. That's not what's going on. What's going on is that the United States is asking Apple to create a new software, a new um, operating, operating system, system, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That would disable this self-destruct mechanism. Now, the United States says that they could do it and then upload it only to this iPhone, and that would be the end. It wouldn't affect anybody, anybody else. But the United States is proceeding under a statute, a very old statute, an obscure statute called the, Eight, the All Writs Act, which was one of the first statutes passed by the United States, you know, in the 18th century after the United States became independent, right? So it basically can be used in any 
investigation where the United States claims that a third party um, could provide evidence for an investigation without, an unre without creating a an unreasonable burden, right? So once Apple creates this program, even if it's a one-time thing, unless, you know, Apple can like, you know, wipe it clean. Like, if, I don't know if you guys saw the movie um, Men in Black. Sure. Yeah. You know how they had, whenever you, they ran into an alien, they would sort of like, with this magic machine, they would wipe the brain of the person who saw it, and that way they have no memory of it. Right, right. Now, unless Apple somehow could purge its own knowledge of how it created the software, every single time any law enforcement wanted to be able to circumvent the security features of the iPhone, they say, look, Apple, you've already written this patch. Just give it to us. That's right. Right? So, you know, now, after that, it really would be re very reasonable for Apple to give this patch to the United States, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, and then presumably states as, uh, state law enforcement authorities as well. That's one thing. Second thing, Apple doesn't just sell iPhones in the United States. Apple sells iPhones all over the world. Two-thirds of Apple's customers are outside the United States. And even if we assume good faith on the part of the United States government, I, I think most of us would not be willing to, to, give, to make an assumption of good faith for Russia or China or Saudi Arabia or yeah. Israel or, you know, hosts of other countries, right? But now these countries will say, well, look, you did this for the United States. If you don't do it for us, you're out of here. That's right. So um, the United States is asking for something extraordinary. They're asking for Apple to actually rewrite its software because the United States can extract or extract evidence. And what's interesting is there's not even evidence that there's evidence. Right? That's this right. Completely a wow. fishing expedition. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Because by all accounts, they, they, they've gotten what they wanted from the phone anyway from the backups. Well, on, uh, no, the that's not exactly bypass. true. I don't think oh, that's that right? exactly okay. true. I okay. mean, the United okay. States claims uh -huh. that they need to see whether there are any co-conspirators. Mm. Right? Maybe he was talking with co-conspirators. Maybe he was talking with the people that were the targets of the attack on that day. This would all be relevant information. I agree that would be relevant information. But on what basis do they think there, that, such, that evidence of that is there in the first place, right? So they want right. Apple to create this entirely new piece of software on the pure speculation that there might be relevant evidence, right? It's not as though in his dying breath, Sayed Farouk said to an FBI agent, oh, all the keys to the kingdom are on this phone and you'll never get it because Apple has this self-destruct mechanism, right? That might, be <laughs> a different, you know, that might be a different case. But here, there's absolutely no reason, objective basis, to believe that there's going to be anything relevant on that phone. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's very disturbing, I just learned this today, is that Apple does have a way of retrieving material from iPhones through iCloud. But that is not applicable here because the county of San Bernardino changed the password at the direction of the FBI. Right. And when it did that, Apple could no longer access any data that would have been in, in iCloud because it becomes wiped out. So the, the FBI itself engaged in an act of obstruction of justice here. I mean, wow. maybe they didn't know that. Right. It's, it's hard for me to understand why they would tell the county of San Bernardino, whose phone it is, by the way, right, um, to yeah. change the password, right? If right. they had not done that, then Apple could have complied with what the FBI wanted without compromising the security of the iPhone, right? Mm, that's now, right. What's worrisome, what's worrisome is that you know, I'm sure you're aware, the United States has been pressing Apple and other uh, high-tech uh, companies for a long time now um, right. about encryption. And this was a big initiative of the Obama administration, they, and they, they sort of backed down earlier uh, sometime last year. Yeah. But Bloomberg published a story on its website on Friday saying that, in fact, the, the administration did not back down, they just shifted tactics. Hmm. Right? And... Um, it appears that they're using this case in an attempt to use the All Writs Act to justify forcing companies to break their encryption codes in a situation where it would be impossible for them to pass legislation authorizing this conduct.
right? Because if there were if there were a federal statute compelling Apple to do this, I don't think anybody would say Apple can't can can avoid doing it, right? I mean, if the United States Congress passed validly passed a statute, the president signed it that said that any manufacturer or any provider of encryption technology is under an obligation when so so served by a court to provide de-encryption technology, then that would be a valid law. But that's a politically very contentious idea. Right. It's very so unlikely I, that that would be passed by Congress. What, so what about saying, the what about the 92? Because I, I remember reading this something about the 1992. Um, I forgot what it's called, like Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, which kind of spells out obligations that telephone companies have. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, and, and and internet provides I, I, ISPs. Apple is neither a telephone company nor a um, ISP provider. Uh, yeah. ISP, right? right. And again, right. this is not a warrant. This is not a wiretap, right? <clears throat> I mean, if they were given a wiretap to monitor somebody's communications on, on iCloud, I'm sure Apple would comply with that, right? But here the problem is, as I said, is there's no statute explicitly authorizing um, what the government is asking, namely compelling a company that provides a lawful product, right, to change that product to assist a government investigation, right? Now, I suggest that that's a politically untenable law to pass. Right. So, Instead of so, what the what the Obama administration is very cleverly doing is trying to use this sort of like very old statute, the All Writs Act, which is nondescript and nonspecific, to say that it, it can they can use the authority under the All Writs Act to compel Apple to do this, right? So it's a very very dangerous and broad strategy. And again, I have to applaud Tim Cook for standing up in the United States. So I mean, the, in in a lot of ways, then you know, we're we're at a point where the the ideological differences that we were we were discussing earlier uh, almost are are don't even matter when we talk about issues of terrorism and things like that. So I mean, what's what's a way out of that where it doesn't matter whether Republican or Democrat, they're expected almost at least implicitly to pursue these very uh, hardline, uh, questionable approaches to civil rights in in pursuit of of uh, cracking down on terrorism. Well, a couple things. First of all, I definitely think there's a difference between Democrats and Republicans with respect to national security and how civil liberties should be weighed against security. I have no doubt that had Nate, had um, Al Gore won in 2000, the reaction to 2000 to 9/11 would have been radically different. Sure. OK, so let's I mean, let me just say state that very clearly. On the other hand, now to be clear, when you say radically different in, in, in which direction, I don't think, for example, the United States would have invaded Iraq. OK, right. Do you so think I, they would have passed the Patriot Act, something uh, that broad? And I, I don't think the reaction would have been nearly as as um, as broad and hyperbolic. And, and again, the Patriot Act has to be viewed in connection with the war in Iraq because once you start, once you're in a permanent war footing, then the national security state really takes over everything. Sure. Right? Um, so the decision to go to war was really, really decisive in how things played out later on. Wow. And I think it would have made a huge difference had Gore been president in 2001 rather than Bush. But aside from that, um, I think this is the, the point that I want to make and i think in which you were alluding if you look in the long sweep of american history right the difference between democrat and republican is less important than the difference between the presidency and the legislature gotcha. in other words, if you look at the history of the u.s presidency right typically presidents seek more power right and that's true whether the, the person in office is a Democrat or a Republican. Right. They try to take power from the other branches, whether the legislature or the judiciary. So if you study administrative law in the United States, it's a history of how the executive branch is continually trying to extend, expand its influence over areas that were traditionally in the domain of either Congress or the courts. So what, what, what Obama is doing, which I think is probably consistent with 
presidents of both parties, is trying to assert the following. Namely, when it comes to decisions of security, the executive branch should make that decision, not the courts. Right? So that is a consistent thread that all presidents have made. Right? And generally speaking, courts have agreed with that. And courts have said, you know, if people want to object to the way the president is exercising his national security powers, it's up to the Congress to stop him, not us. Now, I think that itself is a very problematic position to take because, you know, in some cases, uh, let's say, you know, the Empire of Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, that's one thing. It's a totally different thing if a ragtag group of people living in Afghanistan uh, managed to hijack some planes and blow up New York uh, or, or some buildings in New York. Yes, there was massive devastation in New York, but the capacity of Al-Qaeda to do sustained damage in the United States is just not the same as the Empire of Japan in, in 1941. And so I don't think that um, we can, we can, it, it makes much sense to adopt this categorical rule that courts are institutionally incapable of making decisions about national security law. Um, but that's basically where we are, right? Courts do not make substantive decisions about national security. They defer to the president and the Congress. Right. And right. presidents, whether Democrats or Republicans, are not eager to change that. So that that is a fair statement. But still, I think it makes a big difference who is president. I think mm. typically speaking, um, Democratic presidents will be less, um, for lack of a better term, less jingoistic, uh, right. less nationalistic, much more willing to listen to evidence than uh, Republicans. You, you know, today's Republicans. Right, right. Um, it, it's 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 remarkable that you bring up, um, you know, Pearl Harbor and what have you, because you know we, we just, for example, we're recording what two or three days after the so-called day of remember the day of remembrance, where we talk about the internment of what 140,000 or so Japanese, you know, uh, Japanese uh, living in America, about 80,000 of which were American citizens mm -hmm. um, under FDR and who, who was, of course, a Democrat. So, you know, I'd love to get your sort of comment on, you know, not only the sort of, you know, like like the legacy of the Supreme Court in that regard with regards to the Karamazov decision and so on, um, but, uh, but, but just in general, like kind of relating to what you just said about where these political parties align with regards to these type of issues of security, national security. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the long and short of this, Karamatsu has never been overturned. Yeah, right, right. It's Scary never, precedent. Yeah. It's never been. It's never been overturned. But I think the lesson from Karamatsu is that in wartime, courts are extremely deferential to the decisions of the executive, and in some respect, you know, it's it's. Institutionally, it's easy to understand why. I mean, would it have made a difference had the Supreme Court come out differently in Karamatsu? First of all, it came, you know, the decision was in 1990, 1943 or 44. The war was, was grinding to an end. I mean, the, the, Supreme, the United States Army did not need the permission of the Supreme Court to go out and actually physically move people. They did it, right? Mm -hmm. Courts couldn't actually go out and stop them if they wanted to, right? right. True. So in some ways, this is sort of making, you know, giving, you know, operationalizing the principal discretion is the better part of valor. Don't pick battles you can't win type of thing. Mm. Um, you know, so I think it's very hard from an institutional perspective for a court to intervene robustly in these kinds of situations. But, but and this is where I think, it makes it, they can play a role. It can, I think it, I think if they were to say something like, you know, look, terrorism is really generically different than a war, <laughs> for for lots of reasons, among which is the capacity, the difference in the capacity between an organized state to make war and a terrorist group. I mean, traditionally international law, war is only something that a state can do, right? A group of people cannot wage war, mm -hmm. right? And so. Um, there should be limitations to what the president and Congress can um, uh, do in, 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 in stating that something is a war. I mean, they can't pass a law saying that they're going to wage war against Mohammed Fadl, 
because you know I'm legally incapable of waging war. I might be a, a dastardly villain, but I'm just not legally capable of waging war, right? And so I think there's still some role to play here for courts um, where you have crises that aren't really wars, right? There's sort of endemic violence, uh, low-level violence, and you know despite all the rhetoric. Uh, the actual threat of terrorism is really, really quite de minimis. And I don't see why it should be so hard for courts to question that premise. I think they should question that premise, but I'm not holding my breath. All right. We're not seeing any. Yeah. Yeah. Like with, with regards to the so-called war on terror and, and, yeah. and uh, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's a dangerous zone. Yeah. Yeah. The war on drugs. Uh -huh. if, for a second, you know, if the United States adopted the same tactics that it has, in the war on terrorism as it has in the war on drugs, right? Now, they're both rhetorical wars, no more, no less. I mean, I haven't done any statistics, but I suspect, you know, a fair number of federal agents have died, you know, at the hands of drug smugglers, right? Hmm. Um, and police officers and, and innocent bystanders as well, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But we don't treat it as, you know, a special legal regime because war is a special legal regime. Right? I mean, again, this is something that, you know, most people don't understand, but law is a special distinctive legal regime. And so we need to get out of the law, the war paradigm. Mm. Except with states. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh I I I think we're we're we're, we're uh little over an hour now, um, but so maybe to kind of wrap up, I, I'd love to, maybe if we could very briefly kind of pivot to, I, I know something else that's sort of within your wheelhouse of expertise, which is to, to sort of talking about, um, you know, things that are happening in the Muslim world, specifically perhaps Egypt. And, and, and I'd, I'd love to maybe hear your thoughts about uh, what we've seen happen since the so-called Arab Spring, and, and, and specifically maybe in your own home, home country of Egypt, and, and how that's playing out in the greater Middle East. Well, that's a long, we need to have another session to talk about that. Certainly, <laughs> certainly, certainly. Uh, no, I, I, I'm just fascinated, you know, I, I, I see like, I, I know one of the, one of the courses that you teach is, is religion and the liberal state, um, and, and you know, and of course, given your own background in Islamic law, you know, just to hear, sort of hear your thoughts about about that. Well, as far as Egypt is concerned, I think Egyptians lost a really great opportunity to move forward. Um, I don't know if they'll get another opportunity for another 40 years. And I worry by that time, it'll just be a failed state. Mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, and I think also the coup in Egypt is also responsible in many ways for the continued bloodbath in, in Syria. Um, uh, I think Egypt has been completely uh, eliminated as a regional actor with any influence because of the restoration of, of authoritarianism. The government is completely obsessed with maintaining control of its rule through dissent, through, um, uh, through force because it has real, no, no real popular uh, legitimacy, or I mean, has plenty of supporters, no doubt, but among the politically active classes, whether <coughs> Islamist or non-Islamist, I think it's safe to say that it, it lacks no, it doesn't have any meaningful base of support outside of state institutions themselves. And so it's unable to play its natural role in the Arab region, right? It could have played a role, in, and the former President Morsi was actually trying to form a working group consisting of Egypt, Iran, and Saudi Arabia in, in trying to come to some sort of solution to Syria. Um, now Egypt is just completely relegated to the margins, and I think that's been disastrous for Syria. Um, I think it's been disastrous, uh, not only, for, I mean, it's primarily disastrous for the Egyptians, but right. it's also disastrous for the rest of the Arab region. So unfortunately, I see very little hope um, in the eastern part of the Arab world for the next 40 or 50 years, sadly. Wow. I mean, like how much of that, you know, and we, you know, I remember this takes me back to a conversation we had, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, Shadi Hamid when we had Shadi on. Um, how much of this do you think 
just related to like with regards to the coup, um, you know, with regards to just the inadequacy of the brotherhood in, in, in being well, able to, even though it was 70 years in the making uh, in terms of their desire to, to, to be in a position of power. You know, I, I view this from an institutional perspective, not a, you know, partisan perspective. Right. Um, and I think that the institutions of the Egyptian state are so corrupt, so decrepit, so dysfunctional, right, that no group can actually, no outsider group can actually come in and rule the country effectively because the country isn't ruled through institutions and through laws. It's ruled through an informal network of brute force and networks of corruption, right? So obviously when the Brotherhood came in, they weren't part of those networks of corruption. Um, they try to sort of rule through formal institutional channels, but those channels didn't work. Um, and, and, you know, if one looks at the objective indicia of the Egyptian transition, they weren't any worse than what one finds in other transitional states. So much has been said about the alleged incompetence of uh, the Brotherhood during that seven month period or eight month period when Morsi was president. But I don't think if you look at a comparative from a comparative perspective that the overall performance was any better or any worse than other transitional regimes. Now I think one great case in point is Indonesia. You know, you had um, Abdurrahman Wahid take over as interim president. And again, you, it was a time of great crisis and turmoil in Indonesia, much worse than anything that happened in Egypt. But it did not, you know, but it did not result in a restoration of military rule. And after a few years, Indonesia got got its act together, and they're they're now moving in the right direction. Egypt, unfortunately, took a giant step backwards, and they're continuing to move backwards. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, civil liberties are much much worse than they were during Mubarak years. Right? Freedom of expression is much worse. There is no politic. There are no political rights. Um, you know, and so. All of that was predictable. This is what happens when you have a coup to replace yeah. a properly elected official. And, you know, it's, it's tragic. So many people were in denial at the time that that was what was going on because they were fearful of the Muslim Brotherhood for good reasons or bad reasons. Um, yeah. But they, they seemed to think that uh, somehow um, a coup would be Egypt's answer. But... Um, you know, uh, I think it's clear now, almost two and a half years later, that it's made things catastrophically worse. And there's no there's no plausible path out because the the coalition that successfully toppled Mubarak, right, um, broke apart and many of them supported the coup. So how can you reassemble that? You know, Humpty Dumpty, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back <laughs> together again. And so how can you assemble how how can you assemble a new coalition, right, to replace the military? And that's basically what's keeping the military yeah. in power in Egypt. Not that they're successful, not that they're loved, but because people see no alternative. And unfortunately, I don't either. Right. Well, right. on that note. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I feel like we, we need to, like, arrange a, a second conversation with Prof Professor Fadl just to talk about the the Arab oh. Spring because it feels like we're doing the topic a disservice by just kind of nothing um, uh, on the surface. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and and not only that, but just to, yeah, I'd love to sort of just hear Professor Fuddle talk about you know his view about Islam and the liberal state. But uh, yeah, for another time. <laughs> well, okay, great. I, well, and and as as we sort of wind things up, uh, Professor Fuddle, I'm sure I'm sure our listeners would love to uh, yeah. be able to reach out to you or find you online. Do you do you have a, a Twitter or anything like that that people can find you at? I have a Twitter handle. It's um, named after a pre-Islamic or Arab poet named Shanfara, S H A N F A R A A. And uh, do you do you have a web presence as well? On, uh, I have a, I have a blog. Um, with the same name, www.shanfara.com. -E I don't, I don't blog a lot, um, but I do post things from time to time. Um, but I do tweet a lot. Uh, my Facebook wall is open, so anybody can view it. Oh, perfect. 
and, That's and I'm right. sure they can they can seek you out uh, on Facebook as well. That's right. And, um, and for us, for a lot of his writings are available via like academia.edu and, and other sites. So you know, my, my website, actually, my University oh. of Faculty of Law website has links to basically all of my publications. That's right. That's directly right. or indirectly. Well, perfect. And um, with that, uh, uh, Pervez, do you want to wrap things up for us? Yeah, so no, I just wanted to say again uh, from, from both Zucky and myself, uh, Professor Fuddle, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we look forward to having you back on and continuing the conversation. Um, thank you to our listeners for continuing to, 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 to uh, write in and send us your feedback. And uh, uh, do uh, hit us up on iTunes uh, as well as Stitcher Radio where you can leave a comment as well as a star rating. Um, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, feedback, etc., you can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can check out our Facebook page and hit like and for updates and for other commentary. So uh, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, which hopefully will be sooner than the last time, um, on behalf of Zucky and myself, thank you for listening. Thank you.